this morning um, from the Word of God, and hopefully Patrick's going to pop it up on screen. Uh, we're going to be talking about grasshopper land. I mean, it's about the weather for grasshoppers rather than man at the moment, do you think? So, is anybody scared of little insects, by the way? Or is anybody going to admit they have a phobia about little insects? I have met some people who love them. Uh, my son-in-law just loves anything like that. And then there are other people who go, oh my goodness me, and they fall over and run away. So, um, we'll pray for you later if you have that condition. So, uh, today, and uh, I want to share um, about a courageous man called Caleb. Uh, we're going to be reading, if you want to get your Bibles ready, from Numbers 13, 27 to 33. Numbers 13 to 27 to 33. And uh, a courageous man called Caleb who took on um, grasshopper land. Now... Before we go into it, there were two obstacles to the dream home and the dream destination that Caleb wanted in his life. The first one, and that can be a problem, is that when he was 40 years old, there were giants already living in the home of his choice. It's not a problem I've had. You can have squatters, but maybe having giants in the home that you would like as your own is quite a difficult challenge when he was 40 years old. And then secondly, when he was 85 years old, a little problem of ageism came in. A little problem of age. Now, I want us to look together today at what it was that enabled him to overcome the obstacles and to claim God's promise. What was it that allowed him, enabled him, to overcome the obstacles and claim God's promise? And as we do, let's think about you and me about how we want to, with God's help, overcome the obstacles in our lives and to claim God's promise. Now, Caleb has a great name. Have we got any Caleb's in the church? I don't know if we've got any Caleb's. But I think Caleb's a great name for a child, actually. Brilliant name. Um, Now, you can see up there that Caleb, in the various translations, says, somebody who is completely and and sincerely devoted, determined, or enthusiastic... It also means marked by complete earnest commitment, free from all reserve or hesitation. As you know, I'm the shy retiring type, so that wouldn't apply to me. No joking. But there's another part. Do any of you like sheepdogs? I do like sheepdogs. I like dogs. And um, this one is a a sheepdog with the shepherd. And have you ever seen uh, the way that when a shepherd is walking sometimes, the dog will almost go between their feet? Have you ever seen that? They'll almost go between their feet. They go, (laughs) and I want you to know, and they're looking, eyes, their eyes are like lasers, aren't they? Have you seen, they're like lasers on the shepherd's eyes, say, what are you wanting me to do? They're like, what do you want me to do? What's your command? What's your instruction? I'm absolutely tracking it. And um, the other thing about Caleb, which has a great meaning as well, is it means follow God like a dog. Do you like that? Follow, think of the sheepdog, <laughs> looking at the master, the shepherd, think of Caleb, <laughs> I'm watching you, Lord, what do you want, what do you want, what do you want, I'm tracking you like that sheepdog tracks the shepherd, don't you think that's good for you and me, don't you think that's how me and you should be, tracking the shepherd, following wholeheartedly everything we've got, following God like that sheepdog tracking the master, what do you want me to do, do you want me to go out and get the sheep, do you want me to stay with you? What do you want me to do in my life? Now, we start off, and if Patrick can put the scriptures up for us, I'll just read them through as we go. And if you want to track it in the Bible yourself, we're reading from Numbers 13, 27 to 33. I'm going to pick some scriptures out. We're not going to read it entirely through. I'm just going to read through, talk some comments, and then we'll come back through it again. So, we start off with Caleb in the book of Numbers. And just this last week, I was saying to somebody, oh man, there are some books in the Bible you really don't want to preach on. Has anybody got any particular favorites? One could be Numbers. One could be Revelation. And by the way, I love Revelation. If you look online, I've got a series of 10 on them. Um, But there are books in the Bible where some preachers don't want to go there. But actually, Numbers has got some great stuff in it. And we start off with Caleb in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, And the Israelites are very near the land of promise, right? They're very near the land of promise. And so they send out 12 spies 
and they're gone for 40 days. By the way, does 40 days sound familiar? 40 is quite a big number in the Bible. And by the way, I like maths, so I love it when the Bible does numbers. I really get, oh, that's fantastic. 40 comes in the Bible quite a lot. And when they return, these 12 spies, after being 12, 40 days out checking it out, they said this in verse 27. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. And this land that they'd gone into, can you imagine? You've been in a parched land. You go into this place. You see it's filled with cows and goats and pastures, um, that, and you've got milk. And there were so many bees making honey that, my goodness me, they had so much fruit they had to bring the grapes back on a pole carried by two men to show the produce of the land. And um, sounds like some people's allotment here, I know, Naomi. Plenty of produce. I've seen Naomi's allotment. It's got a lot going on, hasn't it? And uh, I hope it's a good year for you. But remember, their job was to simply survey the land and to report their findings back. They were sent on a mission to survey and report their findings, so they did that. Remember, in the previous scriptures, God has promised that he's already given them this land. It's not a kind of a question mark. God said, I've given you this land. Go out and survey it and then come back. And then in 28, we meet that piece of language, which as Christians, I'm not sure we should even have in our vocabulary. B-U-T, but. B-U-T, but. Some of the spies that came back in verse 28, we read this, they said, but the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there, giant country. So they've gone out, seen a fantastic new land, great promise, God's promised them, and there's a but. Are you good at buts? I'm very good at buts. Uh, I'm an accountant by profession, so I tend to have to look at the pluses and the minuses. So I'm very good at seeing both sides, if you like. But sometimes the buts can get in the way, can't they, of what God has for us and the promises that we have for us. Thank you, Patrick. We go on to the next scriptures, and uh, in verse 29 through, it will also read this. The Amalekites live in the Negev. So you've got a few bad apples in the 12. In fact, you've got more than a few bad apples. You've got 12 bad apples out of the t 10 out of the 12 are bad apples. They brought back a bad report, and they discouraged the people by their remarks. It's worth us just pausing there. We can be very discouraging to other people by our remarks. I see it in families. I was at a meeting last week, and somebody made one remark, and it was like a put-down on somebody else in a meeting. Have any, any of you seen a put-down? Where it's just like a little word, but it's very cutting. Words can be very hurtful. There's the stain, sticks and stones may break my bones. Have you heard that one? But let's be honest, words hurt. Words really hurt. And as Christians, we have to watch what we say because we can build up or we can cut down and really hurt people, can't we? But instead of moving forward in faith, because of these 10 spies' remarks, the people became gutted by fear. They were really gutted by fear. Now, Caleb, wholehearted, follows God like a dog. Love him to bits, Caleb. One of my favorite characters in the scriptures. And Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Caleb's like, God's promised it. He said we've got possession of it. We just have to go and do it. So Caleb simply took God at his word. In verse 2, God had said he was giving the land to his Israelites. So Caleb believed it. Caleb believed the promises of God. And then we get another but. The ten spies again, the negative, the bad apples came back again. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. You know, I, I do like my sport. And I don't know if you've seen, but Ireland beat New Zealand on rugby. Some of you are wondering what I'm on about. 
Some of you may understand what I'm talking about. But New Zealand had a reputation of being the undefeatable. And Ireland has just burst that bubble. Won the series on the home turf in New Zealand. New Zealand, sorry if you're a New Zealand person here today. But it's burst that bubble. They are no longer the unconquerables. They are conquerable and it's burst the bubble. But it's sometimes we build up little no-go areas of saying we can't get through that. It's unconquerable. We can't beat that situation. We can't get around those people. Well, that's not the way that God operates. What I find interesting in life is, have you noticed how some people in life have a lot of energy for complaints? They have an awful lot of energy for buts, but they don't seem to have so much energy for doing. Shall I say that again? I found some people who are very eloquent. They'll write masterclasses on negative comments, masterclasses on complaints. I'm sure the head teacher here gets loads. But when it comes to serving, oh, would you like to step forward and help out with the PTA? Then suddenly everybody backs off into a corner, don't they? And, you know, it's interesting that, isn't it? Think about our own lives. Where's our strength going? Are we putting it into complaints and buts? Or are we putting it into the doing? Maybe we've got to do a little health check on ourselves to say, how much energy are we putting into the two buckets? If you and me are putting too much into the complaints, maybe we need a bit of a cold shower to reorientate our life, to say, God, help me to be positive. I want to be a Christian for Christ. I don't want to be a glass half full. Rather, I do want to be a glass half full. Uh, I don't want to be a glass half empty. I want to be somebody who says, do you know what? Davey's a good guy. Lynn says, yeah, Lynn's a good lady. Always positive. They've always got something to say that's encouraging, that uplifting, that people would want to be attracted to us by the love of Christ in our lives through the positivity they share. Any of you got favorite films? Any of you like films? One of my all-time favorites is The Shawshank Redemption. Anybody seen The Shawshank Redemption? If you haven't, get it. It's absolutely classic. But there's one line in it where Red comes out of prison. He's been in prison for 30 odd years, 40 years. And he says this, get busy living or get busy dying. What's it going to be? As a Christian, I'm choosing to get busy living. Get busy living. I'm just going to pray right now, actually, because I think there's some people who can get so miserable in life that maybe they're in a cloud at the moment and they're feeling like life is going in decay. And actually, the Lord's saying to you, I want you to get busy living. And maybe there's stuff that's happened to you that's really painful, but you need to put that to the side and get busy living. Should we just pray right now? Lord, I just want to pray for brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe somebody's going through a bad time. Maybe they feel like they've got a big rucksack on their back of all the old stuff. But Lord, we pray right now, would you help us to get busy living? In Jesus Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. So we move on to 30. We're on 32. And not only that, these 10 spies go on into exaggeration. And I'm sure none of my brothers and sisters around here today are prone to exaggeration. He said, I must admit on occasions, you know, I can say, oh, it was fantastic that. And years ago, this happened. And before you know it, I could have exaggerated the facts. It's very easy. But they came through like this. Verse 32 to 33, the land we explore devours those living in it. All the people we saw, they're of a great size. We saw the Nephilim there. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So they just felt like little insects that had been bug squashed on the windscreen of the car. They just felt like it. But the truth is that wasn't really what they were. It's just what they felt like. But it wasn't the truth. It wasn't the reality. So I think for us as a church and individually, we have got to be careful if we start using the but word to check out, are we being controlled by fear or faith? Fear or faith. Are you controlled by fear, lots of but, but, buts, or by faith? With God's help, we can do this. You know, that an example of the thoughts that go through our minds. Well, I guess I could do a bit to help out at church, but, well, there is this new opportunity for me, but. I know I should forgive that person, 
but they really hurt me. I know God is with me, but. I think we've got to eradicate a few of the buts out of our language and our vocabulary. You see, these people here, they'd rather go back to bondage than take God at his word. And sometimes people would rather dwell in sin and disobedience, even though it's not a place to be, because it's comfortable on what one knows. Did you hear what I said? Sometimes people know they're like a pig living in squalor, but because it's kind of comfortable on what they know, they don't have the strength or the energy to get out of the squalor. They'd rather stay where it's slightly predictable, if squalid, rather than move into the new. And God wants us to always have the new. So what happens? How many days did I say the spies had gone out? Like numbers. I didn't hear that loud enough. You're obviously sleeping in the sun here. 40. That was a bit more like it. A bit more Yorkshire grit there. And... The ten spies, what we read in Numbers 14, 37, is that the men who bore a bad report of the land, God didn't mess around, they died by the plague before the Lord. They've been so violating what God's command had been that we read later that the men who brought a bad report of the land died by the plague. And how many years did that community have to spend in the wilderness How many years? Give me a number. 40 years. 40 years. I mean, I put 40 onto my age, and you don't want to think about what I'm going to be looking in 40 years if I'm still around. Thank you. Um, uh, Can I just say to you, brothers and sisters, now as we talk together, I do not want this church to be in the wilderness in 40 years' time. Amen? I do not want this church to be in the wilderness in 40 years. I do not want you to be in the wilderness for 40 years because of a but of not walking forward in what God has for you and me and has for this church and for this community. Do you say amen to that? Amen. Amen. You know, what we do today, we've got young people out in a Sunday school. We've got them out in a youth group. And I'm talking here as... I talk to adults and my brothers and sisters in Christ. They're looking to you and to me and what we do, what you and I do today has consequences for the next generation. Do you get that? We have responsibility on our watch to do the right call so that that generation might be blessed. I do not want them to not inherit. I want them to have a great inheritance to have a great Christian life here in Dicot and Oxfordshire. I want them to be part of a great church that preaches the word of God faithfully into their lives. What do you say, people? Amen? Amen. 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 Lord, help us to make the right decisions and to be bold for you, Lord, at this time with this church and the way we do things and the way we go forward. Help us to not keep going backwards. Help us to go forwards. Now, I've got a nice little picture here, I think, of grasshopper. Some of us can have a grasshopper complex. We think we're insignificant, and we allow our insecurities to influence our faith. You know, friends, the issue isn't whether or not we're competent or strong enough. The question is, will you or I take God at his word and trust him with our problems? You see, sometimes the problem with fears is not fear, it's not fear itself, but it's what it reveals about our concept of God. Because I want to be really honest here, sometimes if we're struggling with fear, it's because at the deepest level we haven't got a right relationship of trust with our Heavenly Father. Did you get that? We're fearful because right in our innermost, do we trust God that when it gets down into the difficult situations, He will lift us up. 
he will keep us from falling. And I want to share with you, some of you who may be younger than me, uh, just one or two I know, um, who are younger here today, is I can think of my life. And already I can think of some of the things that I've been through. I've had bereavements. I've had relationship challenges. I've had issue when I was growing up as a kid. I had bullying going on. I had, what else did I have going on? I've lost jobs. I've had to get back up again. But I'm here today to testify that the Lord in his graciousness to me has always lifted me up and put my feet on dry ground again. And he's always taken me to a better place. Isn't that amazing, Grace? And I need to say that to you, maybe who are younger than me, to say, in your life, you're coming at things maybe for the first time. And I say to you, um, as a member of this church, hold on. God will take you to a better place. It might seem low at the moment, but God is going to lift you up. He's going to put you onto dry ground, onto a better place, and take you into that wonderful land. See, Caleb, he's got the right things sorted. In Numbers 14.9, he says, Do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we'll swallow them up. Their protection is gone, is gone but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. I want you to think about your work situations, your school situations, your college situations. Don't be afraid of the people around you that you encounter. The Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. So let's just take some quick stock of lessons from part one of Caleb's life. Number one, sometimes the biggest problem is me. The biggest giant is me. It's not the giant out there. It's the giant that I'm dealing with in me. The biggest giant sometimes in my life, the biggest problem, is sometimes not people out there and what they do. It's me. It's my faith. It's my relationship with God. It's where I'm standing. It's how I'm walking. The biggest problem is me. Second one, God is always bigger. God is always bigger than any problem that we face. Every promised land that has its problems, every blessing has a, some bumps on the journey. Canaan comes along with some Canaanites in it. It's already got some folks in it. Obstacles are frightening, but no matter how big those problems are, God is bigger. The third one is God is faithful. He's a faithful God. Is he faithful? Is he faithful? Yes. Is he faithful? Yes. Amen. He will fulfill his promises, but if you think about faithfulness in a relationship, and I was reflecting on this as marriage, if you've got two in a relationship in marriage, to be faithful, it means they have to be faithful to the other person in that marriage or that relationship, would you agree? So faithfulness, so it means to do that, we need to be in relationship. We need to be in relationship to God so that he can fulfill his, his promises and his faithfulness to us. But he needs to be in relationship with us to do that. We need to have a relationship so that he can be faithful and pour in his goodness and his blessing. The fourth thing, Focus on the fruit to come. Caleb was looking down there saying, it's a good land. There's produce, it's a good place to be. So, last week, I wasn't here, but I understand you had a few people in church for a dedication. Is that right? Was it a bit quiet, was it? Nice, quiet service. Um, I was talking uh, to Guzomo and Stephen about health and safety, and they, they sent me an email afterwards saying, David, we have to practice dynamic risk management. I was like, you have to practice... That, I said, what, you mean panic? Um, and I said, well, we had to work out, because there's so many people here, we had to work out. Praise God. Praise God to have all those dedications. Praise God, by the way, can I just say, uh, Chris and Leanne, Chris, can I give Chris a clap at the back end, Leanne, because it's just lovely to see. 
I'm seeing the little Tonka down there, by the way, and it was so good to see Chris holding little Tonka down there, his little son. It was just great. So pr bless you. So the scriptures are coming to an insect about where we are today. Let's just talk through this. As a church, and Will's talked about it already, we are standing at the edge of what God has for us. We're in Dicot Girls' School, the church has grown, and there is a sense of what next. Now, guys, we could get very comfortable here. We could pull up the doors at a certain number and say, that's our church, we like the people, we like our little groups, we like our little cliques. This is great, that'll do now. Let's just close the doors. But we need to follow him faithfully as he opens new doors for us. He's opened doors for us. I think this is our sixth location. Maybe he's going to open a seventh. Praise God. And it's, we have a God who's bigger. He's going to bless us if we follow him and walk in his ways. So that's as a church. What about as a country? Well... Would you agree there's quite a lot of fear and anxiety at the moment in the country? I mean, I was writing this down. We've got a cost of living crisis. We've got Ukraine. We've got COVID. And we've got, oh, let's just throw in a leadership election in the middle of it as well. I mean, it's quite a lot of things going down. But Proverbs 21.1 says this. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a watercourse. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a watercourse. So even when things look challenging, God can change the heart and mind of our leaders and our government. I do think that it is good, whatever your political persuasion, whatever your views, have you sometimes heard the expression, you get the leaders that you pray for? You get the leaders that you pray for. Should we just pray for our country right now because we do need good government? Would you agree? We have challenges. We need godly men and women effectively to govern our country at this time. And we can say, oh, I don't like them. But if we don't pray for them, what do we deserve? If we don't pray, what can we say to God? Did you pray for them? Let's pray right now. Lord, we thank you for this country. We thank you for the blessing it is. We thank you for the schools. We thank you for the employment that it provides to us. We, we thank you for the friends it gives us. We do thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. But our country faces many challenges, Lord. At the moment, we're praying, Lord, about the cost of living crisis, which many people in this church will be facing right now, wondering how they're going to get through with food costs and with heating costs. We're praying, Lord, about the Ukraine situation. And, Lord, that touches our hearts to see such violence and oppression. Lord, we pray for about the COVID situation. Just when we think it maybe has gone, ahead, gone away, it suddenly rears its head again. And we pray for the leadership of our nation, Lord. We pray for godly men and women in power, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that they would govern diligently and well and that they would seek you in their guidance. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to roll forward, Patrick, to uh, Joshua 14, 6 to 14. And I'm going to read this through to you. And I want you to think about, we've had, effectively, we've had Caleb at 40. And now we've added 45. It would be nice if it was 40, actually, but as a mathematician, I'd quite like that. But it's added 45, and he's 85 years old. And uh, this, is a bit later, this is a bit later on in the story. And now, under the leadership of Joshua, remember the 10 spies who did the negative stories, they died from plague. We've got Joshua and Caleb left. The two guys who said, we can do this, they're around 40 years later after being in the wilderness, and they are still standing. And we can read the scriptures from here. Just to give you a bit of context, many battles have been won, and now they're ready to distribute the land to the 12 tribes of Israel. I'll just read the scriptures to you. Now, the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and I love it, Caleb pops up again, doesn't he? like a good one. He's just like one. Do you ever have those kids you were growing up with at school and they were just like, you'd knock them down and they'd stand up again. I mean, well, they, not I would knock them down, but you know, they would get knocked down and they'd get back up again. It's like, what on earth are you eating? And Caleb's like, well, no, you knock him down, he gets back up again. You knock him down, he gets back up again. He's not having it. He gets back up again. 
And Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenazite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me? So it's 45 years later, and he's remembered God's promise. He has not lost that promise. 45 years later, and he says this, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, remember? And I brought him back a report according to my convictions, not of the other 10, the cowardly custody ones, but according to my convictions, wholehearted Caleb, the dog who follows God, like a dog who follows God. But my brothers who went with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. That's Caleb. Wholeheartedly. Next one, please, Patrick. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Amazing, isn't it? It touches my heart just to read it, that he followed the Lord wholeheartedly all the days of his life. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he's kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses. And while Israel moved about in the desert, so I love it here, it's got an exclamation mark in my scriptures. So here I am today, 85 years old and still rocking. Don't you love it? He's 85 and he says, I'll have you. I love it. It's great. I hope I can be like that, 85. I'll probably scare the living daylights out of you all, but anyway. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle just as I was then. Can I just say to that to you all of you? If any of you are feeling tired and a bit jaded, wake up, you need to be like Caleb. Whatever age, whatever you've been, are you ready to go into battle for the Lord again? Because the Lord wants you to be ready for battle again. Patrick, number 12. Now, give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I'll drive them out, just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephu then, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. And so Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephu and the Kesazite, ever since, read this with me, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, and wholeheartedly, again, because he followed God wholeheartedly, he inherited. So six times the scriptures say that Caleb followed the Lord wholeheartedly. And why did he follow God wholeheartedly? Because he trusted in the promises of God. When he was 40, he believed God's promise to give Israel the land of Canaan. And when he was 85, he still believed it. He hadn't lost that faith. So how do we follow the Lord wholeheartedly? Well, just a couple of quick things. One is, and I'm saying this to you uh, with my particular vintage, is we read in scriptures this from Isaiah 40, 29 to 31. And can I say these words to you for anybody who's feeling a little bit tired and jaded today? Can I just read these words over you? The Lord gives strength to the weary, and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and they will not be faint. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? In Numbers 14, 24... God said that Caleb had a different spirit. He wasn't defeatist. He had a different spirit from the others. You know, we also live with hope because we have a hope of where we're going to be in glory. And for those that might need to hear it today, can I just share with you what the Apostle John wrote of the vision of the heavenly city in Revelation 21? And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And this is the bit 
that particularly if you've gone through any bereavement or sorrow, can I just share this particularly with you today? He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Amen. 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 Now, just a quick challenge here, and if, uh, if Patrick wouldn't mind just putting the next slide up for me, please. Thank you, Patrick. Age is just a number. I don't care whether you're six or you're 96. You know, God has used people who are six years old, and God has used people who are 96. And I think we need to make sure that whatever background, whatever gender we are, whatever situation we're in, God can use us. Don't you think that's amazing? And sometimes it might seem like life has been quiet for a bit, and then suddenly something happens where God uses us. Can I say, are you expectant that God is going to do great things in your life? Are you expectant that God can use you? Because you need to know that, that if you actually commit to the Lord... He can use you in a powerful way. And for those of you that think, well, I'm quite tired now, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. You may feel you've had a ministry. The ministry is gone. I'm here to say that God is not yet done with you. And the best is yet to come. You can see some of the pictures up there. I won't talk through all of them, but do you know the bottom left one? Bottom, well, it's my sort of actually bottom right for you, is it? Bottom right, who's that? Corrie ten Boom. So she was in a concentration camp in the Second World War, a Jewish concentration camp. She came to Christ. Uh, Betsy, she lost her sister in the concentration camp, but she was used for evangelism across Europe and around the world right through into her 90s. And... Um, Who's the guy in the middle at the bottom, by the way? Do you know who that was? Any of you like space? John Glenn, who decided to be the oldest person to go into space. He was one of the youngest, and he was the oldest. And who's the old chubby fella on the right-hand side bottom? Well, you may remember, he was in the wilderness years for many times. When he actually kicked off in the Second World War, he was well in his 70s, if I recollection uh, is right, in terms of the dates. So the best is yet to come, okay? Age is just a number. Now, Caleb was depending on God to be there to help face his giants, and I think we need to be there as well to think that way as well. Now, if Patrick wouldn't mind just putting a slide up for me. If you look at the top, what does that say? Just read it. Now, who said God is nowhere? Honest. Now, a prof put this in front of his lecture theatre with God is no is that on the top. There's two ways of reading that. God is nowhere, and God is now here. As Christians, we've got to learn to read always from the bottom. That is, is we need to look at things in the right way. It's not God is nowhere, it is God is now here. You know, sometimes we're in the midst of struggles, it's hard to see where God is. But as David once wrote in Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the delights of your heart. I need to say to you, by the way, that Caleb, after he had done... Uh, with this particular, pre- expre- uh, this particular passage at 85, do you think he went into retirement? Nah. He's a little fighter, is Caleb. So do you know, we will read on in Joshua 15 that he went on to get from Hebron, we read this, Caleb drove out the three Anakites, that's giants, Sheshai, which means who I am, Hahiman, which means what I am, and Talmai, which means what I can do. So if we think about our lives, before we can sometimes claim victory, we have to fight three of the same named giants. 
who I am. Sometimes that's our ego we have to fight. What I am, that can be the enemy of pride. And what I can do, in my own strength, the enemy of self-sufficiency. You know, so often in life, I've got a little bit overconfident about my capabilities. And usually at that point, I have a fall. And God reminds me that I have to be totally, 100% dependent on him. It's not me what done it. It's not me that got that great sales award. It's not me that got that qualification. I didn't do it in my strength. I did it because God blessed me and God was now here with me. Do you agree? We need to learn that because otherwise we have some real painful messages. Now, some of you know I used to work for a mission organization and I went out to visit some missionaries in a place called Nepal. Has anybody here been to Nepal? Been to Nepal? It's a beautiful place, isn't it? The Himalayas, uh, beautiful people out there. And uh, there's a very fierce fighting group of people out there. Um, do you know what they're called? See, look, Sharon, if you ever have a quiz team, Sharon's my number one plan. Get us, you, you'll win it all the time. So, Sharon, for you, if we put a picture up, please, Patrick, I'll put some Gurkhas up. I'll, and the Gurkhas are fantastic, by the way. They've got an unbelievable reputation, and I'll be honest, I wouldn't want to fight them. No way. Um, can I just read you from a book? Uh, this, this amused me. Can I, is that all right? Can I take the liberty to share with you? In one crowded hour, there's a guy called Tim Bowden wrote in a book that in Borneo in 1964, the Nepalese soldiers called Gurkhas were known for their valor. Now listen to this. This just makes me chuckle because this is typical Gurkhas. Um, and by the way, can I just say to you that when I arrived in Nepal, I was going up to visit a project there, and um, the guy who was running this project out there was building actually a hydroelectricity plant. And he said, he was a mate of mine, he says, David, he's gone to glory now, Peter. But Peter said to me, David said, I've arranged a special trip for you. I said, oh, that's nice. I was thinking this could be nice, nice little coach tour. Do you like a coach tour? And then this little Bell helicopter landed. Have you ever seen the little kind of ones used in the Vietnam War where they've got like the little blubble of glass? And he said, I've arranged for your flight up to the Himalayas, David, up to the dam, and I've got you an ex Gurkha pilot to take you up. We went up these gorges, like, you know when you see cables over the river? We went down, we went up. I thought I was gonna die. But I mean, what a way to rock it up to the Himalayas with a Gurkha pilot in a small helicopter was one thing that's in that brain there. But very, very brave people. But the British command asked a squad of Gurkhas in Borneo if they'd be willing to jump out of an airplane into combat against the enemy. Um, after discussing it for a moment, the Gurkha sergeant replied, yes, we will jump out if the airplane will fly as slowly as possible um, 100 foot above a swamp. And the British commander said, that's too low. Your parachutes won't have time to open at that altitude. Do you agree, 100 foot? The Gurkha sergeant said, oh, you didn't mention parachute. Have, have you clocked that? The Gurkha had said to the bloke, you want us to jump out of an airplane, fine. 100 feet over a swamp, we'll do it, no parachute. The Gurkha just said, I'm gonna do it. Did you get that? I, and that is a true account. In Borneo, the Gurkhas were prepared to jump out 100 foot out of a Hercules aircraft into a swamp without a parachute. So they were willing to jump out of an airplane on an order without a parachute. That, for me, typifies courage. Now, when we fight in the strength of the Lord, we need to be willing to charge into a difficult situation, if necessary, with an empty jolly water pistol. Because we rely on the strength of the Lord. In Ephesians 6.10 it says, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. In Philippians 4.13, It is impossible in your strength, but you must claim this promise. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. 
and I'm done. Shall we pray together?